Hi, my name's Adrian Dorrington, and I'm a senior lecturer here at the School of Engineering at the University of Waikato. And my research is about time of flight 3D cameras. And this type of technology is usually used for applications that we call machine vision. And machine vision basically means computers measuring things, measuring the size or the shape or the location of objects in a scene. So a normal 2D camera makes that a bit difficult. Uh, but the 3D camera gives the computer that extra perspective and lets it perceive the world in the way that we perceive it, which helps it make the measurement. So we do a lot of that research here in this room, and it involves lasers, and uh, we have a laser warning sign here on the door, which means normally we need to wear our safety eyewear. But I don't need that today, so come on in here and get a new perspective on our research. Uh, when I started uh, working in electronics, I was working for the uh, what was called at the time the Defence Scientific Establishment. Uh, it was on the Devonport Naval Base uh, in Auckland. Um, so I worked there for a few years and then um, decided to come to university uh, and did my uh, PhD degree here at Waikato, um, working on uh, LIDAR for measuring wind speed. Um, and after I finished my PhD, I uh, did a postdoc uh, in the US at the NASA Langley Research Center. Uh, and that was looking uh, at methods to measure the shape uh, and the size of inflatable space structures. Uh, it's, it's quite an interesting topic because if you want to build something that's fairly big uh, in space, then you, you've got two options. You can, the rockets are only a certain size, so you can either take it up in parts and assemble it while it's there, or you can uh, make it collapsible, so it folds down to a small space, send it up into, into space, and then inflate it. Um, so we're looking at these inflatable objects, but uh, the designers weren't entirely sure if they were going to inflate to the correct shape. Um, so we were looking at methods to measure the shape of these just to test to see whether they've inflated correctly. And then uh, I did that for a couple of years and then came back here to Waikato to do uh, another postdoc uh, when I started working on the um, time of flight 3D imaging that I do now, um, which is again, it's measuring shape, but it's using a different technology to what I was using at NASA, but the same sort of theme really. Um, the technique that we were using at NASA is a technique called photogrammetry, and that basically involves two or more cameras looking at an object from different points of view. And because they're looking at different points of view, you can take, take these two uh, images it sees and basically do some back projection to figure out what the object is like in 3D. Um, what I'm doing now is it, it still measures the shape of the object, but now we do it from only one point of view. Uh, and it's called time of flight because the camera sends out some light and it measures how long that light comes, takes to come back to the camera. So once we know how long it takes, and of course we know the speed of light, then we can work out the distance for each, each pixel uh, in the scene. The gestures are becoming quite common. If you look at some of the Apple devices, like the iPad, you can, you can do gestures to change applications or go back to the home screen. And they're, they're touching the screen, but they're still gestures. You take that one step further, maybe, maybe you've got your, your iPad in the, in the kitchen and you're reading a recipe and you, you need to change... Uh, uh, page on that, but you, your hands are dirty and you're covered with something, if you don't have to touch the screen, if you could just make that gesture in front of the device instead of actually touching the screen, uh, then it'd make life a whole bunch easier that way. Um, I think we'll see this technology first um, uh, commercialized for uh, things like gesture control, and we're starting to see that with, with the Xbox. Um, and there are also one or two demonstration televisions around. I've seen a television you can sit down in front of and it has a DVD player there. And uh, instead of using your remote control, you can get the DVD to pause by just doing this gesture, or you can change channel by doing this gesture, uh, or you can change the volume, uh, or you can turn the TV off by doing things like this. Uh, so uh, this sort of uh, gesture control has a, has a lot of possibility to uh, remove um, devices like uh, remote controls or uh, you know possibly extending to, to even using the, the uh, controlling um, things in the house. Like if you want to turn the lights on instead of having to get up and go and turn the lights on, well uh, maybe there'd be a camera in the corner and you could uh, uh, make a certain gesture to the camera and uh, turn the lights on. If looking at the data uh, projected from the front, if I, if I raise my right hand, it looks like a mirror looking in the, in the screen. It's uh, the same side as being raised and, you know, you can brush your teeth or whatever you like. But because we have um, 
the three-dimensional information, I can turn it around and look at it from as if it was behind me. Uh, and now, of course, if I raise my right hand, it, it shows up on the other side of the screen. Um, and I don't know if you've tried looking in those tr trick mirrors or trying to brush your hair in the trick mirrors. It's really difficult to coordinate when you're looking at a, uh, an image that's projected uh, the other way around. This is one of the, the examples where I think you, you often you see something in, in a, in a sci-fi movie or, or in a book or something, something that uh, some creative writer has made a prediction about uh, and, and they're starting to become reality. And we see that, for example, in a lot of stuff that was in Star Trek, uh, like he had his flip communicator and, and then we had flip phones and that sort of thing started to become real. Uh, there was a movie a while back called uh, Minority Report, and in my Minority Report, uh, one of the the really interesting things was the first time that uh, the concept of, of a gesture control uh, w was really um, uh, uh, brought to life. Um, and uh, in that movie, he was controlling a, a computer and controlling files by shifting things back and forth. Um, <clears throat> and we can now we have the technology that's actually starting to bring that sci-fi concept into reality. It's great to be working in this field because uh, it's so cutting edge. There's uh, not a lot of people working in it, and we have to work internationally to, to work with people who are working in this field. Um, and although the technology is pretty new, you can see that it's going to have a big impact uh, in the future. And there's a couple of uh, indicators that point to that. Um, for example, with Microsoft, with their uh, current technology, which is, is uh, it's, it's a depth camera, but it's, it's not the time of flight technology that we're using. Um, but uh, Microsoft, a couple of years back, uh, acquired a company called 3DV, which was an Israeli company that does time of flight. Um, so they showed their interest there. And, and just last year, um, they also acquired a company called Canesta, which was a, a Californian company that also does time of flight. So uh, these big players um, are starting to acquire this type of technology. Um, and we know that uh, um, Samsung and Panasonic and Sony are also looking at this stuff. Uh, so we think that it's, it's going to be a big thing in the future. And it's great because my students get a chance to interact with these big companies and, and get in um, basically on the ground floor for the type of technology that's going to be a, a huge thing in the future um, with uh, finding all manner of application and, and potentially even in mobile devices. Uh, just imagine your, your mobile phone that you can uh, make gestures at and things like that. So because this technology is, is starting to become um, uh, practical for use in commercial applications, there are, there are a number of companies that are getting interested in it. Um, these uh, types of cameras, like the one we have here, this is uh, purchased from a company called Mesa Imaging, uh, who are in Switzerland. Uh, we also have sensors from a company called PMD Tech uh, that are in Germany, and also some cameras from a company called Canesta, um, who are in the US. Um, so these companies are, are, are working with uh, uh, people um, who build uh, consumer uh, equipment uh, and also for some industrial purposes as well to, to try and take, bring this technology in and, and take it uh, into the marketplace. So we find that uh, uh, it's an interesting situation because a lot of the science that we're doing, um, we interact a lot with uh, uh, companies. Uh, instead of other research groups. There are, of course, some research groups around the world doing this. Um, but we uh, do tend to interact with uh, the companies and manufacturers of, of this technology because our research is, is all about um, improving the quality of these cameras. Uh, we did early on, we, we did actually uh, start to build some cameras, but very quickly the commercial uh, guys with a more resource, <coughs> commercial entities with more resources um, uh, caught up with us with, with the building and they can, they can build the cameras much better. But because we built our cameras from a, a scientific point of view for a, instead of a commercial point of view, our first camera was, uh, it's still probably one of the most uh, precise and high quality cameras in the world. Um, but it's very big uh, and it needs 7,000 volts and it's very expensive. So it's not really useful in a commercial sense. But what we learned from that is the techniques on how to build a very good quality camera. And we're starting to take some of those techniques and put them into these commercial cameras. Uh, we can try and improve uh, the quality. One thing I can show here is uh, if I extend this out and we can see myself and the background. But we can also see <clears throat> a bunch of points in here 
that look like they're not supposed to be here. And that's on the edges of objects. We can see that the edge of an object is blurring with the edge of an object here. And these, these points are not supposed to be here. If I move my head a little bit, then they kind of go away. But when I move, I keep my head still, there are these, uh, what some people call flying pixels. Uh, but we call them mixed pixels in here. And this is a camera getting it wrong, basically. It's getting the measurement wrong. Uh, and we have technologies to um, in, uh, remove these uh, incorrect pixels and find the correct data uh, from them. And it's just things like that, that we're uh, generating intellectual property that we are hoping to get into some of these commercial cameras. Uh, particularly in New Zealand uh, at the moment, it's, you know, the, uh, government research funding is, is very competitive and, it, and it's quite hard to get it. Um, but when we have an application that is directly related to uh, a commercial use, then um, we can uh, get some commercial funding to solve some specific problems, especially uh, if a particular manufacturer is, has a particular application in mind and they've got a particular problem that needs solving. You know, the camera is, is working pretty well, but it's got one particular problem that's really being um, holding up their uh, development process. Then that's the time when uh, we can come in and uh, possibly get some funding from these commercial companies to try and uh, uh, solve uh, the particular problems using the expertise that we have. A, lo a lot of contacts we make are, are just through networking and, and one particular one was uh, I have one student who um, got a, a Fulbright fellowship to spend a year in the US uh, and uh, he had organized to go to a, a company to do his work, but, uh, and it was almost set, except then um, the US export uh, control laws came into play, and it turns out that he couldn't actually go to that company at all. So uh, that company suggested he go to another company, uh, and the student actually visited there, and that actually um, really started to uh, build a, a foundation for a relationship. Uh, and we started working quite closely with this company, uh, they're interested in some of the technologies and uh, we've had other students uh, visit uh, now and they've provided some funding for travel and, and uh, helping with uh, accommodation for the students and we've had students stay there for uh, a number of weeks uh, doing work with the company. Uh, yes, we have one of my postdocs uh, is now working with uh, one of these companies uh, and uh, I also have another student um, who was uh, awarded a Fulbright Fellowship. and. and um, he's also uh, in the U.S. Uh, at the moment. Mm. Now, people say that uh, you often get the best ideas when you're relaxed. Um, like uh, in the shower, I often think about things in the shower. Uh, but one particular um, idea uh, and one of the bits of intellectual property we have that's uh, of interest to the commercial companies at the moment uh, came about when uh, <coughs> my postdoc and I were at a uh, conference. Uh, and we'd just been to the conference for the day and we'd have been having a look at the posters and listening to some of the talks and, and thinking about uh, some of the things that have been going on. And then we're, we were relaxing after dinner. We uh, were in a hotel at, uh, in Miami Beach, which was quite nice. And we were outside in one of the seven pools and one of the spa pools and we were discussing these things. And we realized that uh, a couple of the different things that we'd been looking at, uh, was something from the conference, something else we'd been looking at the lab and how we can bring these together and, and generate some, uh, some new ideas and some new intellectual property from that. The selective distance ranging um, makes it easier for the computer to uh, recognize what's happening. Uh, it basically removes interference and distractions uh, and helps to improve and clean up the image. So uh, from a user's point of view, if a user is trying to do a certain gesture to get a television or, a, or lights to do a certain thing, uh, it makes the recognition of that gesture more robust. So uh, if uh, without this technology you might find um, that a person has, would have to be very precise about the way they do the gesture or they might have to repeat the gesture to get the computer to recognize that. But if we can improve the quality of the image and, and remove some of the distortions uh, and some of the complicating factors then it would make the recognition, recognition of that gesture uh, easier for the computer and it means that the a uh, person uh, doesn't have to concentrate so much or, or learn how to communicate with the computer with it because the computer can uh, recognize a larger variety of gestures and easily distinguish one gesture from another. 
and some of the uh, gesture controls uh, at the moment, um, you need to, some of the gaming systems for example, you need to make sure that you're standing in a certain place um, and that you make a, a, a gesture in a very particular way so the computer will, will pick it up. And we can um, make the, it easier for the computer to recognize a certain gesture in all situations so the user doesn't have to be particular about the way that they make the gesture and it just makes life easier for the for the person because uh, they don't have to concentrate so much and they don't, they don't have to learn a gesture that the computer will recognize because the computer can more easily recognize uh, a gesture that the person's making. The big thing about the Xbox and that the Xbox Connect and that uh, um, and what was so uh, special about uh, its release is that it was the first gaming system that didn't require anybody to hold a device. So like the Wii, you had to hold the Wii stick and the, the PlayStation, you have to hold the, uh, the PlayStation controller as well. But with the Kinect, nobody actually has to control anything. So you, you're not going to have to fight over the controllers or they're not going to get lost or anything like that. Um, you can just stand up and you can sit there and you can do your racing game or you can play tennis or, or what have you with, without needing to hold anything or without needing to find it or fight over it. So these images here where we've got myself in the foreground and the blue and we've got the wall in the background and the red and we've got these green uh, pixels in the middle that, that are incorrect information on, on the edges and this is where the camera's got it wrong. Uh, we have an algorithm to correct that and we call it a mixed pixel algorithm. Uh, and it's one of these things that just happened to uh, be developed kind of by accident. Uh, it was uh, developed by a PhD student and his original uh, project was to actually refocus images uh, and this is this is a, was an interesting project using a range camera because with a normal camera uh, if you've got uh, part of an image that's in focus and another part that's out of focus it can be quite difficult to correct that out of focus part because the amount of defocus changes with distance from the camera but of course with the range camera we've got a distance measurement so if we know how far away the object is, it's easier to uh, correct the focus and refocus the image. So this was the aim of his PhD project. Uh, but what we realized earlier on is that when you've got objects that are out of focus, they're blurred. So you can have two objects. If they're blurred, they're going to blur together. And one pixel in the image is getting distance information from both objects. And that's actually what's happening here on the edges. And the distance information from both objects is actually interfering with each other and cr creating an incorrect distance value. So what we realized for this refocusing project is that we first had to solve this mixing problem and correct for these uh, uh, mixed distances and separate those values out. So it actually turned out that that problem was a little bit harder than we anticipated. Uh, we were able to do it, um, but the, this particular student's uh, project uh, actually became more about doing this mixed pixel separation than it was about refocusing the images, which was uh, the original idea. So this camera in the corner is uh, one that we've built ourselves and we um, use it to test and evaluate and develop our algorithms on and here we can see it sitting in front of the translation stage so uh, we uh, use that to um, check our measurement distance against the translation stage. The illumination here, we've got uh, quite a large number of laser diodes around the outside of the lens here um, and they're quite powerful and it means that we have to use our protective eyewear uh, when we're using it to make sure we don't damage our eyesight.